So thank you again for joining us virtually this morning. Uh, we really appreciate everyone taking time out of their busy schedules to sit in with us, especially those of you who are joining us early for our breakout session. Uh, my name is Kenny Spade. I work in the operations team with Virginia 811 as a quality assurance and analytics supervisor. And what that means really is that I have a team, we call them the quality team, who work primarily with our external users, our web ticket entry users. And so this morning, I'm gonna spend a few minutes sort of providing a brief introduction, talking a little bit about what we have been doing with QAQC. And then I'll get into uh, a really exciting project we've been working on with artificial intelligence. And we've been working together with Virginia Tech on this. And uh, when I finish, we have Dr. Van Mullicum joining us who will be presenting more about that project and, and sharing some of the nuances. Uh, there. So we have some really exciting stuff to share with you and we'll jump right in here. For those of you who don't know, we have been working with our web ticket entry program. We've had users entering tickets uh, remotely for a good long while. In fact, since the inception of the program back in 2002, we have witnessed more than 8.6 million notices of excavation being generated by these users. And what we do is we go out and we train professional excavators. This happens all across the state. We have users well beyond the state of Virginia, in fact. And it's been a very successful program. We've had tremendous growth over the years. Uh, just last year in 2019, in fact, we had nearly 600,000 tickets come through this channel. Uh, year to date in 2020, we're looking at almost 442,000 tickets. Uh, we're on track to meet or possibly exceed that number from last year. So we're looking forward to that. On average, we see around 2,400 of these web tickets each business day. And so my point here is that we see a lot of tickets, uh, just an incredible volume of tickets coming through this web ticket entry channel. And with these tickets, something we're very interested in is quality. We put a lot of time and energy into ensuring that our quality standards are met with these tickets. And that's kind of where my team comes in. Uh, as you can see there, on average, we're auditing around 20,000 of these web tickets per month. And when I say audit, what I mean is we have team members across the organization throughout the day auditing tickets from all of our web ticket entry users. And it comes around uh, to about 20,000 audits per month. And what they're looking for when they go through is they're trying to make sure that the tickets meet our quality standards. They wanna make sure that there are no errors on the ticket that might lead to confusion with locators. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for things like bad addresses, uh, mapping errors, things like that. And most of the errors that we encounter are minor situations, things that my team would reach out and provide some coaching tips on, uh, provide some training assistance, things that aren't really deal breakers. But in other cases, we find that there are more serious errors, things that might occur with mapping that result in the ticket not going to the correct utility members, uh, that sort of thing. And so with those, we work very hard to reach out as soon as possible and touch base with that user and get that issue corrected. And that's what my team spends most of their day doing, uh, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with users, providing coaching and so forth. And as needed, as we come across some of those more serious errors, we cancel and replace them. And in the event of that type of error being identified, we then increase the frequency of that user's audits through our risk-based auditing process. And so that's just a little background into, you know, what we've been doing, how we're looking at the tickets. And something to note is that historically with our web ticket entry audits, we have gone about selecting those tickets in sort of a random fashion. Um, this has been an area we felt for some time we'd like to improve upon, and that brings us to this exciting project. Last year, through PHMSA, that's the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, we received a grant that would fund an artificial intelligence QAQC process. And we've been working with Virginia Tech on this project. Uh, in fact, we're, we're, I think we've been working on it around a year now, and so it's been very exciting. Uh, again, Dr. Van Mullican will be joining us in a few minutes to provide some of the the details surrounding that project, but I'd like to just give you some context. Uh, pretty much what we did was we, we gave several years worth of data to Virginia Tech. We gave them ticket data, and we also gave them some of our audit or quality data. And what they were able to do is go through and, and perform analysis on these data fields, 
and essentially build a statistical model that would use artificial intelligence algorithms to evaluate these tickets as they come in. And the evaluation will be based on a number of criteria, but at the end of the process, each ticket would be scored with a risk score. And if this designated risk score threshold is met or exceeded, then the ticket would be flagged and that's where my team would pick it up and, and you know, move forward with, with handling that as needed. So the really cool thing about this and the thing we're most excited about is that it gives us the ability to audit 100% of our web tickets. And a, a slide or two ago, I mentioned 20,000 tickets on average that we're going through each month with, with our audits. That's a really big number, but the truth is that's merely a sample of the total volume. And so this will give us the ability to go through and audit 100% of all of the tickets there. And uh, it gives us that more meaningful way to, to go about identifying tickets that might have a situation that we need to address, like an error, that kind of thing. And so we're really excited about this. It should give us the ability to uh, increase the quality with our web tickets. And we believe that ticket quality correlates with dig site safety. So it's very important to us. Uh, we feel this technological advancement is really gonna take us one step closer to that goal that we all share, and that is to keep Virginia safe. And so just a couple comments real quick on implementation. Uh, we are actually in the early stages of a pilot project now, and this is something we're doing internally um, on our computers using RStudio, which is a statistical programming software. And what we're doing with that is just kind of running through some sample data and testing the model and so forth. But the plan is to integrate this with our ticket entry application with our verifier. That's the system we use to audit tickets. And so we are actually, you know, already in talks with our, our partners, Norfield, on that component. So we look forward to, to seeing where this goes. We're very excited to be able to audit all of our web tickets. And, uh, and, and hopefully this will give us the ability to more quickly identify and take action on any sort of error that we might find in our tickets which would again, hopefully uh, help you all, our members, by increasing the safety of the dig sites. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Van Mullicum, who is going to join us and uh, share some more details about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. I'm gonna get set up here sharing. So give me a second to work on the technology, which has not been our friend this morning. <laughs> All right, so we should be seeing my screen now. So I'll do a quick introduction of myself. I am Jennifer Van Mullicum, and I'm the director of the Statistical Applications and Innovations Group at Virginia Tech, which has been around for more than 70 years. And we've been helping researchers within the university on their projects and publications. And in the past few years, we have expanded out to work with companies and nonprofits and hence our partnership with VA811. And I'm excited today to talk to you about work I've been doing in conjunction with Eric Bay, who's a master's statistician at Virginia Tech and works in my center. And we're gonna talk about VA811, using machine learning to screen for safety violations. And I know you may be thinking, oh, machine learning, I'm super excited to talk about that before I've had my second cup of coffee this morning, but I assure you I'm gonna, hire, I'm gonna cover this at a pretty high level today. And I'm gonna really focus on what's important to you um, as folks that are working in this industry. And I want you to know how this model is going to improve your working environment. But the first thing I'd like to do is just to make a quick comment about my connection to safety. I haven't always been a college professor. In fact, for 18 years, I was an industrial statistician working primarily in the chemicals and materials science industry. And I worked most of my career at DuPont. And if you know anything about DuPont, you know they're very committed to safety. And in fact, I worked on some of their safety products that you actually might wear in your industry, like uh, Kevlar, uh, coveralls and, and excuse me, Nomex coveralls and uh, Kevlar gloves. And DuPont has a safety culture that has, I think, helped me appreciate what's going on uh, within this project because I'm not just a statistician back crunching 
your data, I really truly understand uh, the importance of working on data in this environment and the criticality of, of getting it right and making things safe for everyone out there and reducing uh, damage risk as well. So as we get into the talk, uh, we're going to break it up into four different areas. We're going to talk about kind of an just introduction to the project, which Kenny set me up nicely for. And then we'll go into AI and machine learning, just a little bit of an overview so you have more of a concept of what that is. And then we'll talk about the VA811 model and finally conclude with some of the project impact. So let's get into the introduction. And in terms of the introduction, what I really want to focus on is the idea that we are interested in reducing the risk of damages here. Uh, we all know what it's like to, to not have our internet or, or worse, power or uh, gas. Those are all problems for, for us in our daily life, and so we want to reduce that. We want to improve our ticket quality. And we want to create the safer work environment as well as efficiently use the resources at VA811. And in order to do that, we set about putting together a model. But before we model anything, we have to set up some oper operational definitions around what we are modeling. And so in terms of operational definitions, internally within their systems, VA811 has several um, safety violation audit codes. And as Kenny mentioned, some of those are kind of minor issues. Others might be uh, things that are more serious. And so if we had an accurate ticket or if we had some sort of minor issue, like maybe a cross street issue or a minor misspelling, say the word street is misspelled, that's probably not going to impact uh, the identification of the the excavation area. However, if there are gross inaccuracies, like an inaccurate address, or the location description is such that it, it can't really be understood, those are things that are going to be considered a safety violation. So we have kind of a binary classification that we're trying to model here. Either something's a safety violation or not a safety violation. And kind of with that in mind, what I want you to do is think about the idea of the current auditing process, which Kenny mentioned is random. And so with the auditing process, we're going to have a web ticket that's going to be entered. And then we're going to make the decision to randomly audit that. And again, that's around 35%. And based on that random audit, if we're not put into the random audit, at that point, no further action is going to be taken on that ticket. If something is put into the random audit, then it's going to go through an initial screening. And this initial screening is, of course, by a human. And so that human is going to make a determination whether or not this is a safety violation. And if it's not a safety violation, then no further action will be taken. If it is considered a safety violation, then it's going to go on to a next level of auditing. And that next level is from an expert auditor. So they're going to make a determination on whether or not it's a safety violation. At that point, it would go, if it was no, we'd take that ticket through no further action. If that ticket is deemed to contain a safety violation, then at that point, corrective action is taken to remedy the problem that's uh, within the ticket. So that's the current process. And what I want to do is kind of get right to the punchline. What's it going to look like with the model? So I'm going to talk about the future state of this audit. And I, I want to say that we kind of have the benefits right there on the slide. Um, the benefits are we're going to have this 100% audit uh, for the web tickets that uh, Kenny was mentioning. And in addition, we're going to identify two times the safety violations kind of over your previous audit process. And so we start again with that web ticket entry, but what's happening now, we are going to have all tickets being audited by the model. So this time, rather than uh, going straight to the kind of the random audit, all tickets will be audited by the model. And if something is not thrown into, uh, or is not a safety violation, then it's going to be thrown into 
kind of a random selector because we still want to have some checks and balances on our model. We don't want to just believe our model is going to work in perpetuity. It's important for us to kind of build in some monitoring for that. So it'll go into the random selector. And then if the ticket is not selected for audit, then no further action will be taken. Now, let's say that we felt that that ticket was a safety violation or it is selected for random audit. Then we start repeating the same process that you saw on the previous slide, where we go through auditing anything our model said was going to be a safety violation or anything that was selected from this small percentage of kind of random audits that we're going to do for our checks and balances. And we start the process that you saw on the previous slide all over again. We go through the initial screening, we go through the expert audit, we go through the determinations of a safety violation and ultimately get to corrective action being taken. Kind of the key points about this future state are the idea of this 100% audit and the benefit that we get from the model by identifying approximately two times the safety violations that we were able to audit through our previous process. And that's simply just you know, through the speed of the computer and the quality of the model uh, that we have. So with that in mind, we want to understand a little bit about how this model works. And to do that, we have to understand something about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we're just going to give you a couple quick definitions. So in terms of artificial intelligence, what we really want to think about is, you know, machines thinking like humans, making human decisions um, on a daily basis. I, it always marvels me that, you know, my Alexa says, you know, happy Wednesday, John, to my son because she recognizes his voice. And that's all a statistical algorithm kind of behind the scenes. I want to focus on the idea that VA811 is focused on decision making for this and the decision making is, is something likely to be a safety violation or is it not likely to be a safety violation? So the artificial intelligence is really the system altogether. The machine learning algorithm is the, st the statistical algorithm behind the scenes that's processing this massive data and recognizing the patterns so that we can classify things. And again, we're focusing on safety violation or not a safety violation for the classification for you all. So what is one of the building blocks of machine learning? Well, it's this idea of a decision tree. And so I wanted to pull together kind of a toy example of a decision tree. And so we're doing one around repairing the brakes uh, in, in my car. So I might go through some sort of decision process. You might have a similar decision process. It might be a little different. And in fact, you're probably not thinking in this tree structure, but yet if a computer were trying to mimic these decisions, it would kind of function in this tree structure. It would figure out what's most important to making that decision. And you would ask maybe a series of questions and have some variables that you're kind of inputting answers to things like are the brakes making a noise and you would follow that decision tree down to the idea of yes I'm definitely repairing my brakes or maybe I'm going to wait and assess and your decision probably has risk associated with it whatever decision you make and you kind of weigh that risk and so that's what we have to do in terms of our algorithms as well when we get to the implementation point. But the reality is behind the scenes, the, the computer is kind of using these decision trees as a building block. And so hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what they are. The type of model that we used for VA811 is something called a gradient boosted machine. And really what it does is it fits a lot of different trees. It, it's kind of an ensemble model where it uses a bunch of trees to make a decision. And in terms of these trees, what it does is it will create one of them. And then once it creates one, then it's going to fit several more. And it's going to say, you know what, this one is the one that strengthens my entire model the most. It picks up on the weaknesses of the other tree in the model. And then it's going to continue to do that iteratively, always picking the, the tree to kind of enter the model that strengthens the predictions the most. And then again, it's going to use all of those to make a decision. And so all this is happening kind of in a series of complicated uh, computer code behind the scenes. So what does the VA811 model look like? Well, let's go through a description and talk a little bit about the performance of this model. 
So we have inputs to our model, and our inputs are in the form of some things that you might be familiar with, uh, the idea of the ticket system data that comes in to VA11 through the web ticket entry. And these are things like, you know, account name, latitude and longitude, location of the ticket, the time of day the ticket's entered. But then we also looked at data from other sources, and the data from other sources includes things like Census Bureau data, regional data, meteorological data that we pulled in from outside uh, data sets and merged in. Then we also have something called engineered features, which I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. But all three of these data sources go into kind of the black box, the idea of this gradient boosted machine model, and it pops out a percentage chance or probability of a safety violation. So we've got a number on a scale of zero to 100. What's the probability that this is a violation? And so we fit that model based on three years worth of audit data. So over 540,000 data points that were audited that we kind of had the answer to what the true status is for a safety violation. And then we also used information that we gleaned from 1.7 million tickets, three years worth of data out of just the, the typical web ticket entry system. And some of that um, 1.7 million tickets, some of that information was actually used to engineer some of the features that we put into the model. So let's talk for a minute about an engineered feature. Sometimes the data that we're given doesn't have all the information in it that we would like or um, all the information in it that we need in order to make a good predictive model. And so what we do is we work with subject matter experts. So this was to truly a team effort um, in terms of, of working with, with Scott and Kenny and Jackie and Steve and everyone at VA811 um, to really understand the subject matter and capture things that weren't represented within the web ticket data. And what we did is we created these variables, we created these features to increase the predictive power of our model. So let's talk a little bit about what those are. Here are some examples of, of engineered features, which I think will resonate with you. And so engineered features really being this idea of we can maybe calculate it from our database. And so one simple one is the idea of ticket completion time. We had an um, entry completion time, we had an entry start time, and so we could look at kind of that elapsed time for, for ticket completion. How long did it take uh, to get that ticket entered? We could also focus on the fact that we were seeing um, more errors associated with folks that seem to be kind of copying and pasting uh, location descriptors within the database. And sometimes they might forget to change something that, that's important. So when we started looking at the ticket volume per an account per 24 hour um, period, within a thousand foot radius, we went through and geographically searched and we were able to kind of pull that count together of this thousand foot radius within a 24 hour period and figure out that that was associated with the prediction of a safety violation. Um, other things that VA A11 provided to us was the idea that a longer excavation description means that it's often a complicated case and the more complicated things are, the more opportunities there are for misinterpretation. So the length of the, the description field was one thing that we put into our model. Another thing that um, we looked at within the Virginia Tech team was the idea of text mining. Could we do some natural language processing in terms of the excavation field description? And what we found out is if you use the words north, south, east, and west in your excavation description, you're more likely to have a safety violation because those words can sometimes get misinterpreted by the person entering it or possibly by the person reading the ticket. So, those are examples of engineered features. All those go into our model and then out pops this percentage chance of a safety violation. But of course, we mentioned earlier that we're actually trying to make this binary classification, this dichotomous, is it a safety violation, yes or no? And so when we do that, we have to create a threshold for kind of a cutoff. And so given this industry uh, obviously wants to very much avoid damage, wants to avoid any safety level incident, and wants to protect 
and there are people out in the field, we wanted to be very conservative in this case. And so we focused on the 2.5% mark. So basically anything's greater than 2.5%, it's going to be considered a safety violation, anything less than 2.5%, and it's not. So when we go back to our audit process that I showed you at the beginning, kind of that future state, the idea is that anything with more than a 2.5% chance of being a safety violation is going into that human audit track. Anything with less than 2.5% is not going to be in the human audit track, it'll be in the random audit track, and it may get selected as part of the checks and balances on the model. So we also want you to know that when we chose that threshold, we chose it with respect to erring in favor of our false positives um, in order to catch a larger number of true positives because the model's not always gonna be 100% right. If, if it was, we would have a crystal ball and, and know the future and not even need to fit a model because we would have such a good system already set up. So we really focused on this idea of maybe inspecting a few more things than we need to, getting those false positives, and then finding out they aren't really a problem versus the other way around. And again, that's related to really understanding the ethics and the criticality of uh, executing this model. So let's talk about what are the limitations of a model because I never like to put a statistical model out there without talking about the limitations. And in terms of the limitations of the model, you know, it's not like uh, 20 years ago when you guys started your web ticket entry uh, portion of, of this business that you said, oh, in 20 years, the statistical applications and innovations group is going to fit a predictive model. What information would they need? No, most companies are in the situation where the data they collected is, is kind of a set of data they need to run their business or satisfy regulators it's not set up perfect, perfectly for us to be able to model. For example, we don't know the lag time between when a site is marked and when excavation actually begins. We don't have a real-time feedback loop on the fact that an excavation description was not clear when somebody went out to mark something. That does come back in, but it comes in after the fact. And in order to collect data like that, it seems like, oh, that's very easy, but those of you that, that work in um, areas where you're interfacing with computer systems know that upgrading a computer system, there's a lot of costs, there's IT governance. Um, it's not just as simple as snapping your fingers and adding another field into your database. So that is one of the challenges. We're hoping at some point maybe we can uh, really think through what would be a good data collection plan to kind of shore up this model in future generations of this project. Also, we have some statistical technical limitations of kind of linking text to, to maps of the excavation polygon. Here's an example on your screen and you can see here's the address that was given and here's the location of a utility pole that they want marked um, the three foot radius kind of around. So, we definitely see there's a disconnect here, but statistically kind of understanding those markings on the map and matching them to this description down here uh, create definitely uh, a, a big technical challenge and a real-time challenge, and especially one where we need access to maps. So let's close with some project impact. And this is the part that I think is most exciting. It's, it's this idea that really we are still doing a 35% audit, but we're increasing the detection by a factor of two. So we're now able to find uh, two times as many safety violations as we were detecting in the previous audit process. And I think that's pretty amazing to be able to do that uh, with just the implementation of a statistical model on a on an administrative database. Now I will kind of let you know that uh, you know don't hold me to this next year if it comes back and it's 71 percent instead of 74 percent. I think a lot of times when we quote statistics we want to believe they're the truth um, when certainly statistics is the, the study of uncertainty or at least could be defined that way. So I do want to let you know that 
you know, there will be some random variation in this. So we're going to say approximately 2x, um, but stay tuned for maybe a future report on the performance of the model. So what are our next steps? Well, next steps are really around model implementation, actually getting this to work um, in integrated with the ticket verifier, and then ultimately model monitoring because we want to see how our model's doing over time. Finally, would be targeting, creating more of a, a true AI kind of self-updating system. And then um, focusing on next generation modeling where we could bring in matching up the text to the, the polygon map um, that you saw on one of the previous examples. So I'd just like to remind you as we close of the, the project goal and the benefit, the fact that we are reducing the risk of damages, we're resulting in improved ticket quality and a safer work environment. And with this efficient use of resources by still auditing around 35% of our tickets, but really having a filter that now catches twice as many as we were able to catch um, with just human audits alone. So that concludes uh, my portion of the breakout session on using machine learning to screen for safety violations. And Sage is always happy to partner with anyone out there that might be interested in similar type projects because Sage is a portion of the experiential learning. I'm not, I'm not doing this to get rich and famous. I'm doing it to help students learn how to be collaborative statisticians and data science scientists in the future. And so we'd love to partner with you if you have a project 